Hi, David Moore, Equity Vantage with Bob Smith, Peregrine Private Capital. And you know what? I misspoke. Before we get to debt and a few different topics. <laughs> you, you, you didn't lie like government. You misspoke. Yeah, I misspoke. Okay, exactly. That's, well, yeah, well. I, I, that sounds better. It's like, it, does, it, does. it sounds better. It's like, you know, when people, I, I used no. to talk about, you know, the stepped up basis happens when you die. Well, I thought it sounds better when you say, when you become an angel, your heirs receive the properties of stepped up basis. Doesn't that sound better? Oh, it's way better. <laughs> Pardon his French. Anyway, so uh, I just uh, thought we maybe ought to talk a little bit about, a little bit more about cost seg. And uh, I just think it's important for people to understand what happens with that. And, and once again, typically, you're, if, you've got, if you're just coming from the rental house world, you're probably looking at, at an allocation of dirt, an allocation of the improvements, and you're writing off those improvements over whatever the government deems their investment life is, which happens to be 27 years on those properties. 27, 27 and a half. It's 27. <laughs> anyway, but each thing has a different schedule and you got to understand what those are. And, and by breaking a building up into a gazillion different pieces, you're going to take plumbing, lighting, flooring, concrete, different than blacktop, all these things and accelerate it all. But Bob, what happens in the institutional world when you're, when you're looking at it? it uh, that's a really good question, David. And I think it's something that it's very, very important for retail investors to be aware of because as you just said, you know, coming out of, hey, you know, I've had rental houses forever, a small apartment building. You're probably not familiar with the concept of cost segregation. And again, I'm not a CPA, albeit uh, we do have some knowledge with regard to cost seg. And cost seg excuse, excuse me, one yeah. question, one comment. So understand that cost seg is typically done, it's, it's like an engineering base. You can have people come in there and they literally do a study of that thing. So right. that's why Bob made the comment he did. This is not something that a typical CPA is going to do, and we're not going to do it for you. You're going to hire a professional that does that cost seg study for you. You're exactly right. And that's one of the advantages now, principal advantages of DST properties, because they're bigger properties. They're, you know, they're, they're provided, they're institutional quality properties provided by an institutional entity and managed in the same manner. And so as prices of properties kept going up and up, and acquisition cap rates kept going down along with cash flows, <laughs> institutional providers in the DST space had to do something to compensate for that, to make their programs more attractive. And so now what many of the better DST property providers are doing is cost segregating their assets for investors, meaning you know they've got you know they've got a, an apartment property, they've got a senior living property, they've got a self storage property for that matter, and they have a team come in and just take it apart. For, in terms of they put a value on a door, they put a value on the windows, they put a value on the flooring, they put a value on everything, and what that does is hugely accelerate the depreciation on that asset and and allow investors to shelter a correspondingly greater percentage of that income stream from taxation. So even though you may only have a 5% cash on cash return now as opposed to a 7% cash on cash return available in the past, if you're able to shelter most of that income from the cost segregation process, perhaps you have a tax equivalent yield now of 8 or 9%. And I'm just throwing out numbers, uh, approximations. So one of the things we think people should, one of the advantages of DST at this point in time is more and more DST sponsors are cost segregating their assets, which provides for greater uh, tax sheltering of that income stream. So you as a potential DST consumer should be looking for that or should be asking about that when looking at a DST property. So cost segregation, I think, is a very, very important, uh, com should be an important component of anybody's reinvestment decision. And it's not something that lots of retail investors have a lot of familiarity with, as you just mentioned. And, and, and if you'd like to know more on this topic, 
just type in on YouTube, equity advantage, uh, cost segregation. You're going to see a whole series uh, with me and a buddy, Jonathan Frizzell, that's uh, professional in that space, and, and he covers a lot of good information. Actually, we're going to have to get him back on the channel to do it again because he's uh, made a lot of changes over the last uh, decade. And actually, I don't think it's been up there that long, but just in the last few years even. Uh, but it's a very interesting topic, I think. If you don't think it's, it's interesting, it's going to put you to sleep pretty quickly too. So anyway, uh, back to my comment on the debt. All right. So we're talking about the debt on DSTs. And I think that one of the real important things is it's not recourse to you, right? So it's always going to be there. Uh, one of the objections people have sometimes is the loan to value. So maybe if you can talk about the LTVs and I guess my, what, what I think is really important with LTVs on 1031 is that there's so much misinformation out there. If you've watched my videos, I always talk about one of the fallacy, biggest fallacies of 1031 is you have to replace debt in an exchange. You do not have to. Okay, debt can go away two ways. One by going down in value. The other way debt goes away is by adding cash. So one of the objections that I've heard over the years going in the DST is, that, well, gee, the DST only has 50% LTV and I'm selling at 75% LTV and I can't do this. And, and obviously they've got you know a couple different options. You've got a, a, a mix of, so one of the things I love about DSTs is you've got diversification, right? You can diversify into different asset classes, different regions, different uh, loan to value too. So if you've got zero coupon stuff, you we, we had to use a lot after the last crash to get people maybe that leverage they needed. But I want to tell you, debt goes away two ways. One, by going down in value. The other, by adding cash. It's not a problem for you to put money into a deal. All right? So if you're offsetting, we say mortgage boot with cash, it's totally fine. You cannot offset cash received with mortgage. So when we're looking at a DST mix, one of the things you're going to work with Mr. Smith about is figuring out what, what we need to do to make you whole. And, and I also want to stress that the 1031 is not all all or nothing. It's not all or nothing, right? So don't every dollar you spend more on something you want costs you a buck. If you don't spend it, maybe it's 30 or 40 cents. So really get that good team of people together, understand where you are with stuff and offset maybe the gains in the real estate with the losses in Wall Street or something like that too. But it's not all or nothing. But I, I really want to stress, let's talk about the debt on a DST and how it works and what you do to take care of people's maybe debt obligations in those situations. Now, as you just mentioned, uh, all debt on DSTs is non-recourse to the investor, meaning the investor gets the benefit of the debt in terms of meeting the debt replacement requirement in 1031 exchange when you're in a positive leverage environment, meant the increased cash flow that that, that provides and the additional uh, tax sheltering at your end via uh, interest expense. So those are all good things, albeit the investor is not on the hook for the loan. The signatory trustee of the loan is the property sponsor, so they have recourse if, you know, everything if the zombie apocalypse occurs and everything goes dark, they have resource. They do not have re recourse to any of your other assets. So uh, non-recourse debt is arguably the best debt you're going to ever have, and that's what encumbers DST properties. And there really is a spectrum of debt on DST properties. The average leverage point right now on DSTs is probably in the low 40% range. A year ago, before rates started to go up, it was about 50%. But as the cost of money's gone up, leverage has gone down. That being said, we have at our behest, in I think 2008, 2009, after the single family housing market uh, collapsed, we told the folks at Inland, that they should create a zero coupon like DS coming out of the financial services industry. We're familiar with zero coupon bonds and you should create a zero coupon like DST, which is very, very aggressively levered. And the monthly income stream does not go to the investors, but goes back into the property to aggressively retire that debt and build equity because we're going to need people. We're going to have, excuse me, we're going to need debt for investors coming out of programs that they bought in a higher leverage environment. So we have a zero coupon DST product that is levered 75, 76, 80 percent. So we can always meet your debt replacement requirement by mixing and matching debt from, say, a zero-coupon DST with <clears throat> different 
cash flowing DST programs and that mix coming together should meet your debt replacement yeah. requirements. So it's very flexible that way. So it's really important for people to understand going into a potentially turbulent time. I'm not going to say we're in a turbulent time, but uh, potentially turbulent time. What a nice guy. I am. I am. So after the last crash, it took us about a decade. Uh, we've got a uh, we've got a bunch of lawyers we work with, but one in particular, Connie Rathbone. She sort of made her made a name in in uh, you know institutional real estate workouts, and and we get calls that this project was going uh, actually into foreclosure at the eleventh hour. Something would happen. They'd be working to you know get it taken care of, and the servicing companies would be predatory. So they'd be working along like, hey, we're going to save this property for the investors. Eleventh hour, boom, they want to take it to themselves. And and back to my comment a few segments ago on phantom gain, the, the deal is if the debt exceeds the basis, you've got tax exposure on a loss or, or either a loss through foreclosure or short sale. And a lot of those clients had a simple choice to make. They, they could uh, lose the asset and pay tax for the privilege of doing so, or they could engage us to structure the exchange. And a lot of those people went forward into your zero coupon DST stuff because that was a solution. And you're saying, well, gee, I don't get monthly cash flow. You don't, but you're going to get the upside of the property over time. And it isolated you from any tax consequence of that phantom gain. So I, I think it's really important for people to understand, you know, one, that, that LTV is, is, it can be changed. You don't have to pay off a property predisposition if you don't want debt on the replacement. But there are products out there that are going to offer you a variety of loan to values. So uh, don't go away. We'll be right back. David Moore, Equity Vantage, and Bob Smith, Peregrine Private Capital. Thank you.